I'm Daniel Agater, and I am uh, CEO founder of Armada Investments. And I just want to tell a couple of stories on what I'm doing to enable the world that I want to live in. I've, I'm an entrepreneur myself. I'm a founder. I'm a unicorn founder. I started my first company at age 18. And while a lot of the lessons and the founders today are quite similar, what has changed is that founders used to dress differently than today. <laughs> I started importing Macintosh peripherals into Switzerland, moved to the US, discovered the internet as the conduit to connect my buyers and suppliers, scaled the company, raised venture capital, and ultimately sold the company two bubbles ago uh, for about $5 billion record setting at the time, um, to Ariba, which was subsequently acquired by SAP. What have I done the last 20 years? I've been providing founder capital. As a founder, raising from a number of investors, you realize pretty quickly some of them are kind of difficult. And they ask you, hey, Daniel, did you make your numbers this month? And others help you think bigger. They are the ones I call when I was facing a fork in the road and had to make decisions on a pivot. So my motto is, I want to back founders the way I wanted to be back as a founder. So I've been on my entrepreneurial journey now for 35 years almost. And I've invested in about 60 companies, and 35 of which are active today. It's really been an incredible year. 25, or 22, 21 of our companies raised collectively $5 billion in 2021. Or ten years ago, I was interested in fintech, and my guiding principle in all the companies that I invest is: Do they enable the world I want to live in at least a little bit? Make something cooler and have a kick-ass product that is at, le at the very least not toxic. For example, Nutmeg is a digital wealth manager, helping people achieve a digital portfolio, uh, sorry, a, um, uh, a diversified equity portfolio starting at a thousand pounds. Help get rich slow rather than trapping people in a debt trap. That company uh, I was instrumental in founding, a larger shareholder for most of its history, sold to JP Morgan earlier this year. And 26, another superstar, I was in the Series A. Uh, and so there's a, a long list of companies uh, here in Switzerland, Bexio. Uh, been, a, been a wonderful success story. I think Jeremias is here. He's done an amazing job as a, as a founder. But what I've really been interested in and spend more of my, most of my time more recently, and the reason why we're all here, are some of these moonshot investments. So what would the world I want to live in actually look like? This picture is a visualization that we created to think about, you know, what could this be? But this is not just a science fiction vision. This is a work in process, because these are the portfolio companies that are working on creating that world that I want to live in. That world is a world of plentiful, clean energy. We want to leave, live energy-rich lives that are clean. And I like to get my sandwich from flight tracks rather than from through a bicycle delivery. Um, SpaceX delivers broadband anywhere on the planet. Lilium gets you from point to point, electric and clean. And Oclo is small micro nuclear reactors that can power our lives and also the carbon capture machine that is required to suck the CO2 out of the air. And probably the most audacious bet, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, Fusion Energy. It's been a pipe dream for a long time. And, but in order to make this picture come true and become our shared reality, we need to back the right founders. And when I, when I see the climate use of today striking on Friday and saying, what am I going to do 
to shape the future, I will tell them, don't strike on Friday. Join one of these guys and work on weekends. That's the way we're going to enable a shared world. So I've had the privilege of working with a lot of founders. And what I can say from my experience is you don't know how tennis is played until you see Federer. You don't know how to paint until you see Picasso. Founders are not equal, and not every painter is a Picasso. The most amazing founders that I had the privilege to back, they have a number of things that they have in common. One is a unique determination and a stamina. And when I mean stamina, it also means dealing with setbacks. Yarif here suffered a horrible skiing accident and sits in a wheelchair. It didn't stop him. He's really been absolutely inspiring how he has um, actually risen to the challenge and, and built this company, uh, and I think it has its brightest days ahead. Lilium, um, when Daniel had a model aircraft, he showed me his business plan. It was pretty much a one-pager with a plan to build a two-seater and milestones integrated on one page. Uh, now he's working on a seven-seater, and the company is listed on NASDAQ. And what these founders have in common is they are able to figure out an elegant solution to a massive problem, breaking down the big problem into several smaller pieces and coming up how to organize that in time. I generally prefer individual founders over founding teams because there is the individual founder that ultimately gets all the stakeholders in, the early customers, the early investors, and the early employees. But the team changes over time, and the first team that you have for customer 1 to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, that team consistently changes. The other thing to look for is why now? Why was it not possible to build this company five years ago, and why not five years from now? What are the changes in the market dynamics, in the market architecture, in the competitive dynamics, in the regulatory landscape that enable the company to be built now? now Bob Mumgard, Commonwealth Fusion raised last week $1.8 billion. When I first met him, I was like, okay, a fusion startup. Yeah, that's like 40 years of failed science experiments, and it's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. But then he showed me how he's going to solve that problem differently, and that is by creating high-temperature superconducting magnets that are 50 times more powerful than any magnet ever built. And he said, I'm going to use a Series A to demonstrate that these magnets work. And he did that. And at the end, he saw, uh, uh, delivered the magnets uh, with 20 Tesla and used it to raise his Series B. So 1.8 billion for a science experiment. You might ask yourself, are we in a bubble? Yes. We are in a bubble. We are in a financial bubble. And when you look at these companies, and the companies that I look at every day, and all, everything that, that, that I get approached with, there are a lot of startups looking, essentially, to get rich quick, to solve pretty short problem, easy problem. You know, let's basically say we're going to launch the 18th scooter company, but our scooters are yellow. Right. It's just not that interesting, at least not to me. That's for other people. Uh, or grocery delivery, or whatever it may be. So there are so many companies that are just not unique and differentiated. Uh, and what I found is that you know, competing for these actually bottom left deals is actually hard in this environment, because a lot of people are chasing these. But if you go for the long-term hard problems, there's a lot less competition, because not a lot of people want to work on the long-term hard problems. So, we are in a bubble. A lot of investment decisions that were made in 2021 will, will turn out to look really stupid. I've lived through a couple bubbles, and this is the biggest one I've seen. However, we are in a financial bubble. We're not in an innovation bubble. And what matters is that when the tide goes out and we find out who's been swimming naked, what matters is that we also have a bunch of kick-ass entrepreneurs with a full piggy bank to solve the hardest problems. 
And if you're building your team and you've got to figure out how am I going to solve these hard problems, you want to have the right people by your side. And to those that are raising now, I would, say, I would advise, especially the early stage people, don't optimize for valuation. Optimize for support. Think hard about who you want by your side, not only in the people you hire, but also the capital backers you bring into the partnership. You want people on your side that provide help and coaching in good times and bad, and we all know it is not a straight road to success. When I look back at my own experience, one of my most interesting and most value-added backer was Steve Jurvetson. Steve invested in Tradex uh, in 97. I met him for the first time in August of 95. And when I read his book, I was like, okay, this guy is a certified smart guy. Stanford, two and a half years, um, uh, worked for Steve Jobs. Um, uh, and then in 2006, he had a founder that, was, um, that wasted pretty much most of his money from his previous startup on a couple of rockets that blew up. You can guess it. His name was Elon Musk, and Steve Jurvetson has been along for that incredible journey for 15 years. 